Hey, Merry Christmas. So here's what I love about that song that we just sang. You know, we sing the, the, the song, uh, Ring the Bells, okay? But then there's this key, this key word on the end of that, Emmanuel. And if you haven't grown up in church, this may be new for you. But if you have grown up in church, you're going to be really familiar with what Emmanuel means. Because Emmanuel means God with us. And God with us changes everything. Because when God is with you, then you don't have to worry about fear. Like, you don't have to be in fear because God is with you. And God is very clear. He is for us. And if God's for us, it doesn't matter who's against us because we just have to learn to trust and rest in him. And he's going to take care of everything else. So when we sing the word and when we praise the name Emmanuel, we are saying, God, thank you for not being distant. He's not distant this morning. He's actually with us. His spirit's among us. His spirit has something to say. And I'm excited for what he wants to share with each and every one of us in his own unique way today is we're getting ready to wrap up our series on David. But we've named this this morning, we've named, I've named the title of this talk, Missteps, Messes, and Makeups. Anybody in here ever have a misstep led to a mess and then you had to go make up with somebody? Yeah, me too, me too. Hopefully that wasn't your story this morning getting ready for church. What is it about like the 1045 or the 9 o'clock? You're like, we can't be late, we got to get there. And what happens before we go to church? We fight. It's crazy. We're going to go worship God. Hey, kid, we're going to go worship God. You better be ready to worship God. I mean, it's, it's wild. But hey, man, we've all had like our missteps. We've all had of our mess ups. And we've all had to make up. And the truth is we've all done that with God too. And so today as we look at David's life, one of the many things, one of the many things I love about God is that he lets us see David as David is. A guy that is a man after his own heart, but he's a guy that's not perfect. Like he has his own missteps and he creates his own messes and he's got to make up with God. And we're going to see some of those, mis, those uh, missteps, messes, and uh, Lord willing, a makeup today. Um, so... Let's dive into that. Oh, sorry. I, this is really key to, uh, key to saying this. The reason God lets us see this, I can't believe I almost forgot this. The reason God lets us see it, and don't miss this. The reason God lets us see this is being, in seeing David's missteps, messes, we get to see who God is. That's why we get to see this. Because in seeing how David blew it, we get to see how God is faithful. We get to see his love. We get to see his mercy. We get to see his goodness and his faithfulness. So I want to make a preemptive strike this morning. Based on what we're going to talk about today, inevitably, inevitably, somebody is going to reflect upon their own life. And not just somebody, but somebody's. You're going to reflect on your own life. And what I want to tell you is, before we dive into this, if you have humbled yourself, acknowledged your sin before God, sought forgiveness and repented, you have been forgiven. God has set you free. Live in the freedom he has purchased for you. Don't live in the past, okay? And so if a little voice begins to whisper and tries to draw you back into your past, ignore it. Turn it off and reflect on the faithfulness and the goodness of God because you have been forgiven. That sin is as far as the east is from the west. It no longer exists. Your freedom's been purchased. Good? All right, that being said, we good? All right, we're good. All right, cool. Hey, turn in your Bibles with me to uh, 2 Samuel chapter, uh, chapter 11. And let's just look at uh, David's life here in four verses. It says, in the spring... At the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab. Now, if you don't know who Joab is, don't sweat it, but let me just fill in the blanks for you. Anytime you read about Joab and David, Joab is David's, uh, he is David's number one general. Okay, he's the, he's the top dog in the army. He's, the, he's David's number one general. And so David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. And they destroyed the Ammonites and they besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. Now one evening, David got up from his bed and he walked around on the roof of the palace and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent somebody 
to find out about her. And the man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And then David sent messengers to go get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. And then she went back home. Now, you don't have to be a follower of Jesus. Like, you don't even have to believe in God to know that that's wrong. Like, what happened right there is he slept with another man's wife. That's adultery. And, man, even if you, even if you, you don't follow Jesus, you know that that's a no-no. Like, we don't do that. It's not okay. But the question is, the thing that I want to talk about is, how does a guy that God has said, this is a man after my own heart, this is a guy who loves me, how does that guy who wouldn't dare raise a finger against Saul because he didn't want to dishonor or come against God in any way, like how does that guy mess up like that? How's he make, how's he find himself in this big mess? I mean, here's a guy after God's own heart, but this guy who is supposed to be the king, the leader, the ruler, he's supposed to set the stage. How does that guy mess up and misstep like that? Well, it didn't just all happen that day. Sure, it happened. But there was some stuff going on in David's life well before that that led to this. You see, it's the tiny missteps in our lives that lead to the messes in our lives. It doesn't always happen all at once. And most of the time, if we take a series of tiny little missteps, like we just take a little step here, a little step here, and it seems innocent and it seems like no big deal. But really what's happening is those tiny missteps are pointing our lives in a certain direction. And oftentimes we don't pay attention to it. And David's taking these tiny missteps that's brought him here. You know, the glutton never wakes up one day and says, well, how'd I get here? Is a series of tiny misstep after misstep after misstep that brought him there. The person who's overwhelmed with financial debt never wakes up and says, well, how do I wind up here? It was like a series of decision after tiny misstep after misstep after misstep, spending money that they shouldn't have been spending, that they just went little bit, little bit, little bit, and then they wake up one day and they're like, whoa, it created the messes. I promise you, when David woke up in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, when he woke up from his nap that day, he did not set out to dishonor or disobey God. He wasn't like living his life like, you know, I've been pretty good for a while. I've been setting a really good tone for everyone. I just want to go turn a wild hair loose. Like he didn't do that. But he had been making a series of tiny missteps that led him to this one. And God in his goodness is going to show us what those missteps are. And we're going to look at them. So one that we can learn, learn from them. But in looking at them and seeing them revealed, we're also going to get to see the goodness of God today, which is where we're heading. But let's just look at one of David's missteps. Turn just one page, maybe two in your Bibles, back to 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 13. Last week we talked about, man, David, Saul, Saul and Jonathan are killed. David becomes king. He sets up, he's king of Judah, not all of Israel yet. He sets up his capital in Hebron. Well, we see that after Saul's heir dies, David gets to become over, becomes king over all of Israel. And in 2 Samuel chapter 5, we see his first misstep. It says that after he left Hebron, David took more concubines and wives into Jerusalem. David took more. You see, he already had two. He had a wife, Abigail, or uh, he had a wife, Michael, that was Saul's daughter, and he had another wife named Abigail, but he took more. So, what is David's misstep? David's misstep is this is that David failed to address the underlying issues driving his decision making. Like David failed to address, he's making these decisions, but why? Like if you ask David, like why are you doing this? Like maybe his buddies were like, David, you already got two wives, why are you taking more? David's not paying attention to the why behind the decisions he's making. And it's these tiny missteps that are going to create a mess. You know, maybe for David it, it was just selfishness. Maybe he's like, man, I'm going to do this because I can Maybe he saw what he liked and he's like, you know what, I like that. I like the way that looks. I'm going to take that. 
Maybe, maybe it was greed. Maybe it was just greed. He's like, you know what? I want some, I like, I like what I see. I want more because what I have isn't good enough. Like it's not satisfying enough. And what we see is we see David, rather than pursuing God, he is focusing all of his attention on himself. And these tiny little missteps that he's making is going to lead to a mass. And he's focused on himself. And we get to see that David failed to address the underlying issues driving his decision making. The second miscue is that David was in the wrong place at the wrong time. How many of you have ever used that analogy before? Like, hey, it was just wrong place, wrong time. Like maybe you forgot your wallet back home and you're like, oh no, I, I've got to buy lunch today. So you run home to go get your wallet and you get in an act, like you grab your wallet and you head back to the intersection and you get in an accident. You weren't supposed to be there. Wrong place, wrong time, something happens. And one of the interesting things about wrong time, wrong time, uh, wrong, time wrong place is sometimes the story is comical because it was totally accidental. Like, man, I was in the wrong place, wrong time. I ran into somebody with an ice cream cone, and I just got ice cream all over me. It got my face and my hair, and it looked silly, and everybody else laughs at you. It's funny. But there's other times where we're lazy or we're disobedient, and we just choose out of defiance to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And one of David's missteps was just an act of laziness, and I think there's some other stuff we'll talk about behind it, but he is at the wrong place at the wrong time. How do we know this? How do we know this is a misstep? Well, let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. Because it says, in the springtime, or in the spring at the time when who? Oh, man, you got to say it. Dude, I feel all alone. When who? The kings. Awesome. What's David? He's a king. In the springtime, when kings uh, go off to war, David did what to Joab? He sent them. Out with the king's, the king's men, the whole army, the Israel army, they destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. And I promise you, David got reports and clapped his hands. But David did what? He stayed, he remained in Jerusalem. David never should have been there. He was in the wrong place. You're like, it's his home. Yeah, but he shouldn't have been there. Because you see, it falls to the king, the leader, and the leader's supposed to lead the people. The leader's supposed to be there with his army. He should have been out there leading the troops, not only in the conquest, but in the pursuit of God before the conquest. David had a job to do, and he didn't do it. And oftentimes, that'll get you in big trouble. David found himself at the wrong place at the wrong time. And what do all wrong place at wrong time stories have in common? They often don't turn out well. There's some disaster. There's something that happens. And that is certainly going to happen in David's life here. But again, I want to ask the question. David chose not to go. Why? What is it driving that decision? You see, something is driving that decision. David's not just making it. Something's driving it, and I would tell you that it's probably pride. It's probably he, God has made him so successful that pride's built up, and he's like, you know what? I've been whooping up on Philistines for the longest time. I'm going to let Joab take him out this time. I'm just tired. I'm going to stay back at the palace. See, I don't think his choice was necessarily sinful on the outside. He's like, man, I've been doing this. Joab, go do it. But what was driving it was sinful. It's his pride. And God had made him so successful in church. You guys should read this. If you read through 2 Samuel chapter 5 through 2 Samuel 11, what you will see is it wasn't David that made David successful. It was God that made David successful. And he got prideful and he woke up. And he woke up at the wrong place at the wrong time, and it was another misstep in his life, and it's going to lead to a mess. And what I would tell each and every one of us is, let David's life be an example to us. Because the third misstep happened shortly after that. One evening, David gets up from a nap, and he sees this beautiful woman taking a bath. Check out verse 3. And David sent somebody to find out about her. Well, what's the misstep? 
Because you see, when the guy comes back, when his servant comes back, the servant sees what's going on here. He knows his master, he knows his king is looking at Bathsheba and he's out on a mission. And when he comes back, he's got some critical information that the king needs to hear and the king needs to know. And so he knows by sharing this, how he shares this is very important because it could cost him his life. And so he frames it in the form of a question, but he's like a lawyer, man. He's, ca- he's calculated. He is leading the witness, hoping that the witness will see what's going on because he asks David, hey, David, isn't that Bathsheba? David's like, so? The daughter of Iliam? So? The wife, David? Hey, David, she's married. That should have mattered to David. The wife of not just anybody, David, but she's the wife of one of your best friends. She's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. You guys, Uriah the Hittite, Tammy talked about him a couple weeks ago. He was one of David's mighty men. He was like one of the 30 guys that David trusted his life to. And this guy trusted David, and David trusted this guy. This is one of his closest friends. And this, this servant is like, David, that's Uriah's wife, man. Because he knows what's coming. And here's his third misstep. David didn't listen. David wasn't listening to the people trying to help him. That employee knew what was going on. That servant knew what was going on. And the guy is trying to protect David, but David won't listen. So I want to bring those three missteps. Tie them all together for each and every one of us because there's a critical lesson here for us. And here's the lesson. When you fail, and I'm going to put it this way, when we fail to deal with the underlying issues driving our destructive decisions and we ignore the people who are trying to help us, we will find ourselves in places we shouldn't be making decisions we know aren't right. So when it comes back to these tiny missteps, we got to look at the underlying issues. And this is where I want you to reflect on your own life. I want you to evaluate the decisions that you're making. Are the decisions you're making bringing you closer to God or are they pointing you in a direction that you don't want to be going, that's going to lead from a misstep to a mess? And don't just look at the series of missteps. Don't look, just look at the decisions. I want you to really get underneath the surface. And I want, to ask, want you to ask yourself, why am I doing this? Because there's a reason. There's some brokenness there. For, like for David, selfishness. It could have been greed. could have been lust. could have been any one of those three. It could have been all three. But if you're making a series of decisions that you know are missteps that aren't heading in the direction that you're going, in order for you to stop making those choices, in order for us to stop making those choices, in order for me to stop making those choices, we got to do the hard work and evaluate, why am I doing this? Where is the brokenness? Where's the disconnect? Where's the sin? It's there. And here's the beautiful part about this. is like we have a place called the healing place. That if you don't know what it is, but you're, or if you can't define it, or if people around you are defining it, or if you know a little bit, go please, please today, do the hard work, get to the healing place, and identify what those issues are so that you can stop taking those missteps. Because if you continue on that path, it's going to lead to a big time mess. Nobody in here it wants to make a mess. Nobody wants to have to clean up a mess. Nobody wants to have to go and apologize and say, man, I'm so sorry, I blew it. Nobody wants that pain. I know you don't want that pain, but in order for you to avoid that pain, what you have to do is you've got to dig beneath the surface of the decisions you're making and figure out what is driving it. Something's driving it. There's some brokenness there. It's that way for all of us, and we've got to do the hard work to figure out why. We've also got groups on Friday night. There's people just like me. There's people just like you. And they, what the, the thing that separates us, and it's a beautiful thing, is sometimes they're just at the end of themselves. And they're like, I need help. And I know that there's those of us in here that may need that extra step. And Friday night, there's a group of people who will come around you and not condemn you, but say, me too. Me too, because the truth is we can all say me too. Figure out what's driving it. Please, please, save yourself from a big-time mess. Well, David doesn't save himself from that. 
And not only does he sleep with Bathsheba, but he gets her pregnant. And isn't that an interesting thing about sin? Like sin never stays put. Like it doesn't stay in place. Like it doesn't behave. Look at what happened in the Garden of Eden. The original sin. Our lives, your life, my life, it's all been impacted by it. It never behaves. It never stays in place. And David thought what he did in private would just stay there, but it didn't. And she got pregnant. And this afternoon, you should go through and read his cover-up. Because what does sin want to do? It wants to hide and David in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 6 through 27, goes to great lengths to hide his sin. Great lengths. I would even say disturbing lengths. I would definitely say sinful lengths. Why? Because sin wants to hide. And he's trying to hide his sin. He knew it was wrong. I mean, we already read it this morning. Look at what it says in verse 4. David sends messengers to get her. She came and he slept with her. And then... She went back home. When you're living in God's plan for your sexual purity, you don't have to go home because you're already there. He knew it was wrong. He sent her away. He's like, you got to go home now. He's like, I can keep my servants quiet, but if this got out, this would be bad news. And it got, his, his, his missteps led to a mess that got even bigger than he thought. She became pregnant, and you should read it because in the end of the day, he had her husband, he had, him ordered, he had it ordered that he would be murdered. He, he made it look like an accident out on the battlefield. It was awful. He tried to hide his sin. I want to tell you this about yourselves this morning because we get to look at each other. You all look good. I bet this morning when you guys were getting ready, I bet all of us in here, except for maybe a couple of cute little tiny kids, I bet we all stood in front of the mirror. And I bet we all smiled in the mirror to make sure a waffle wasn't stuck in our teeth. Why? Because when you go to church, you want to look your best. You want, like, you want to be presentable. But God doesn't care about the outside. He cares about the inside. And David's out there trying to protect his image, trying to hide his sin on the outside. But guess what? He can't hide it from God. And we can look really good on the outside, but God's not concerned with that because he's looking in here. He wants this to be good. I love telling my kids, like, if I think that they're lying to me, Shaney's the professional. Like, she should be an interrogator. But she'll look at them boys, and if she thinks she's lying, she'll be like, you lie to me. But you can't lie to God. And their eyes go like, Phew. It's a great lesson for us. You know, we can, we can hide from each other. We can put up enough of a mask, enough of a wall that we look good, but we can't hide what we're doing from God because what David did in private, God saw all of it. And here's my favorite part of the entire story. Here's my favorite part of the entire account. Is that God led David so much that he wouldn't let his sin go unchecked. And what I love about God's love for us is he loves us so much that he won't let our sin go unchecked. You see, God's plans were way too big. They were way too strategic to let David throw these things off because God is going to usher in Jesus Christ through David's line. And he's, and he's going to save the world through Jesus Christ. He's, too much is going on. Too much is on the line for, for God to allow David to wallow there. And so you know what God does? Is he's like, David... Or he says, he, he goes to a priest. He gets the pastor. Okay, so you're trying to hide your stuff, and all of a sudden the pastor comes along and calls it out. I mean, like, that's a double whammy, isn't it? Like, oh, the pastor showed up and just called me out. Oh, it's man. Well, God loves David so much that he goes and grabs the priest named Nathan. He's like, Nathan, I've got a message for you that I want you to give to David, and we're going to read it because it's so good. God gives Nathan this beautiful illustration that he knows is going to suck David into the story. He knows it's going to make him mad, and then he's like, Nathan, once we get David there, I want you to deliver this punchline, and let's see where David lands. Now, Nathan, you may be scared, but I'm with you and I'm for you. Don't give up, man. Don't, don't worry about it. I'm in this I'm in this, Nathan. So let's read this account in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and uh, see what happens. So the Lord sends Nathan. Sorry, one more thing I'm going to say here. If you want to know who really loves you, if you want to know who really loves you, 
It's the people willing to call you to account. It's the people willing to call you account even if it makes you mad. You want to know who loves you? You listen to that voice right there. Because once you get past the message, what you'll probably see is love. And there's going to be a harsh message coming for, for David through Nathan from God. But let's see how, let's see how uh, David responds. So Lord sends Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, hey, David, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, and he had bought it. Now, he loved this lamb. He raised it. It grew up with him. He grew up with his children. He shared his food, drank from his cup, even slept in this guy's arms. It was like a daughter to him. How many of you guys got pets? How many of you guys have had pets for more than a year? You would say that that pet is like what? Family. That's what Nathan's saying. That's God's illustration. He's like, this little you lamb is like family to this guy. David gets it. So now, verse 4, now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare the meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man, and he prepared it for the one who had come to him. And when David heard this, David burned with anger against the man. Nathan set him up. And David burns with anger against the man. And he said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Isn't it amazing how David could see that sin so clearly? He could see somebody else's stuff but he couldn't see his own stuff. Isn't that shocking? You want to know why that happens? Because sin blinds us. Like sin blinds us to our own stuff. That's what sin does. Completely blinded. Like David saw this for what it was, and he burned with anger. He was frustrated. He was mad. And he's like, that guy needs to pay. There's a really important lesson in here. And Jesus spoke about this. But it's a lesson that we need to be better learners of in the church. If you don't go to church on a regular, regular basis, you're going to love this. If you go to church on a weekly basis, you're like, I'm a follower of Jesus, this one may sting a little bit. Remember, sin blinds us. But Jesus says, don't judge one another. He goes, why, why look at the, uh, at the speck in your brother's eye when there's a plank in your own? David is looking at this, and he's like, oh, my goodness. That is not all right. That guy should die. And now look at what Nathan says. Or now look at what Nathan says in verse 7. Then Nathan, after telling that illustration, said to David, you, David, are that man. You had like seven wives, and you had a whole lot of concubines, and you went and you took Uriah's wife. You had to have Bathsheba, and you put him to death. David, you're that guy. And now David sees. It's part of the makeup process, being able to see our own sinfulness. And here's the beauty. If we could just see the depth of our sinfulness, then the beauty of God and Jesus Christ gets that much more beautiful. His grace, his goodness, his faithfulness gets that much better. David could see what happened, and I want us to see his response. Because this is critical. He's seen it. He's seen his mess. And look at his response in verse 13. It's part of the makeup. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. He says, I blew it. I blew it. He didn't say, somebody made me do this. He's like, I don't know how I missed it. I don't know how I got here. But I blew it. He humbled himself, and he said, God, I'm sorry. And this is an absolutely terrifying moment for David because when we first met David, we first started this study, and he first met Saul, 
the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. And David knew what a tormented king looked like. And he was scared to death that God would remove his spirit from him. And to be away from the presence of God for even a second absolutely was terrifying to David. If you want to know how terrifying, we've got an extra second, so I'm going to do it. Please flip with me to, uh, to Psalms chapter 51. The beauty about the book of Psalms is David wrote many of these Psalms, and you can actually see David's thoughts in real time. And in Psalm 51, we get to see David's thoughts and reflections in real time of what happened when Nathan confronted him with his adultery of Bathsheba. And this is what David says. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Just humbles himself. He's like, Lord, I blew it. Please forgive me. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and sin is always before me. Skip down to verse 10. God, please create in me a pure heart. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. It's part of the makeup. And now I want you to see God's response through his, his prophet Nathan. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. Do you see that? Do you see that the Lord led with love to confront David? But do you see how the Lord followed through with love? God followed through with love. Glory, hallelujah. If a guy that loved God that much could make a mess like that, and yet Jesus, that God could forgive him, that means there's hope for you and me too, right? He chose to forgive him. But I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. Because if you read just a few sentences later, God loved David so much that he let him deal with the consequences. He's like, David, I've forgiven you. I've forgiven this sin. But I am going to allow you to have to deal with the consequences. And if you read through, they are steep. Some is, one is immediate, but there are others following that are painful. But I believe that that's part of God's love for us. That's part of God's teaching in our lives. He loves us enough to correct us. And I'm reminded of the, uh, I'm reminded of the, the scripture that says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but if you'll yield to it, it will produce a, a harvest of righteousness. And man, when if you ever, you know, if you got this thing going on and there's consequences, man, just trust God to produce a, a harvest of righteousness in your life. But don't ever doubt for a minute that you have been forgiven. He's forgiven you. If you find yourself in a mess today, the forgiveness that God extended then, he extends to us now. You need but humble yourself, acknowledge your sin, ask forgiveness, and live in the grace of God that is available. If you're not there yet, but you find yourself on a road, these little missteps that are heading to a mess, it's not too late to stop. Stop, evaluate, get help, so that you can avoid something like that. I thought the best way that we could end our service and our times together is by singing this beautiful and wonderful song. It's called, I Am Redeemed. And I hope that that is the reality that you find yourself in, that you have humbled yourself, you have sought forgiveness, that you have been forgiven, because the truth today is, is that God redeemed our souls from death, from hell, so that we can have life through the shedding of Christ's blood and his resurrection. And because Christ lives, we can live in him eternally. And we can live in freedom. Thank God. Redeemed. That he did not leave us as we were, but provided a way out so that we can be who he made us to be and live in the freedom that he created us to live in. There is a world dying to know that. And this week, God may prompt you to share that message. In the event he does, and it feels risky, it's okay, that's what we do. We take risks to pursue God, because in doing so, we get an opportunity to love somebody like Jesus. And they need to know that Christ died for them too.